And we're recording now. Welcome, boys and girls, cats and dogs. Uh, we are an inclusive channel around here. And look who I have with me. It is Limon Crochets. Um, you have several different names on several different channels. What shall I call you today? Uh, Limon is totally fine. That's actually my okay. name. Um, and depending on whatever the platform is, I just modify the last name to it. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, tell us everything there is to know about you. Sure. Um, well, I'll try and condense it. <laughs> um, but uh, essentially, I, in relation to crochet, I only recently got involved in the fiber world personally about less than a decade ago. Um, my grandma, who was terminally ill at the time, uh, she... I made it my mission as the one of the cousins in my generation, meaning the, the children of my aunts and uncles, to pass on the craft because she did teach uh, my aunt, some of my aunts and my mom for a little bit when they were little, but she never really taught any of the children of, of her kids. So um, as I just literally asked her if she could pass on the craft, whatever the basics that she knew to me. So that way I could at least have some type of ownership over the legacy of the craft of crochet um, with someone here, you know, that I wouldn't want, I would have hated if she left the earth not teaching someone. So uh, especially in the younger generation. So I made it my mission and she did, she taught me the very basics how to chain. It took me a while, how to chain. I was a very tight tension <laughs> crocheter at the very beginning. Like <laughs> I couldn't even poke the hook through <laughs> a chain or a half double crochet to save my life. Um, and that's all that she managed to teach me um, was just, you know, double crochet, half double crochet and how to chain. I did my first scarf, which was just a long, long, super long rectangle. Um, and then from there, I really, uh, Mexican crochet is very different from American or West or a little bit more North crocheters. Um, Cause you know, you have the, and I did a little research afterwards. I was like, why is everything so different when I would Google it here in the, in the States? Um, in Mexico, they're all about the lace work and all about uh, tablecloths and just lace work within garments. And they work with, if people complain about fingering weight here in the States, in Mexico, it is even thinner and it's harder. It's more like tensile. I think it, I think the material is called, um, but it's, that's, that's pretty much all they do doilies and everything like that. And I, I personally <laughs> couldn't, um, I don't have the patience for that. <laughs> Also, I, it, it tends to hurt my fingers after a while doing that type of um, crochet. So I personally started researching what it looked like here in the States. And I got really inspired by um, hot couture um, when it comes to incorporating crochet. So I started off, my first project as a beginner was literally a sweater in the round. And that was just because I saw knitting. And I was like, why can't we do that with crochet? And I got jealous that knitters usually do everything in the round like that. And crocheters, it's not really, it's not a go-to technique um, starting. So I self-taught myself after my grandma passed away um, a couple years. And that was just like a personal thing. Like it wasn't really something I wanted to share with people. And so, uh, and I was doing Zumba at the time as well. So I went to school, I came back after a few years and I needed to find my footing and what I really wanted to do. And uh, a great therapy for me was crocheting. So I self-taught myself how to do more complicated stitches. I uh, was trying to understand the concept of clothing in terms of, you know, oh, you could do it in different panels, you can do it all in one piece. You just have to, you know, figure that stuff out first before you actually attempt to get a little bit too crazy. Um, fast forward a few years and I decided last year to go public with it. And that was just very, I'm very, how do I say it? It's very, 
I'm very loyal to my therapies and to my crafts. And it, I was always a child that wasn't artistic growing up. My brother was the one who was be who was able to draw. He was the one that was able to do the spray paint, uh, space art, and he was he went to school for architecture. And I was always just the numbers, the nerd, the reader. I was never really someone who could manifest something with my hands. And I was always super jealous of that fact. And so I was very grateful that my grandma taught me this craft because I discovered that I could create something with my hands. It wasn't all just, I felt very that my only purpose in life was just to be a thinker. And this really changed my life chip into being like, no, you can actually make something with your hands and share it or not. But at the end of the day, you get a ball of yarn and you turn it into something. <laughs> so that to me was very revolutionary. It opened my mind. And I'm, like I said, I'm very, very grateful that the um, fiber community has been very responsive to me because it was something that started off very personal. And when I opened up the channel, I was just very, very scared that it would end up becoming, that would end up feeling like a business that would end up feeling very cold, not cold, but like it would, that it would lose its meaning. And so it hasn't happened yet. We're only a year in, <laughs> I have fun uploading whenever I, I can. And cause I mean, yeah, I mean, YouTube is, it has its algorithm. So if you're not uploading quite often, it, you'll just fall off the radar and stuff. So in a way I've been able to find a balance internally in terms of how much content I should put out and the actual finished objects that I do, because I actually do finish more objects than what I share on the channel, which is what my Instagram is usually is for. My Instagram is more like my way of not talking and just throwing out my art out there. And YouTube is more about like, just taking a moment to just talk to someone, even though it's the camera <laughs> or it's like, you know, it's just a light and a camera, but sometimes you just, it helps when you have just, an idea of who might be listening and whether or not that would be interesting or not. Um, but yeah, that's that, that's that now. And then now I'm currently uh, entering paralegal school so I can go into law school. So I'm balancing crochet and, and school right now. Uh, I should be starting in a couple weeks, my classes. Wow, so many things to, to talk about there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So many starting points. Yes, yes. No, um... Pick yeah. your poison. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where to start. Now, you have had humongous growth on YouTube and Instagram and other social media. Um, and I think it's partly because you do, you're very bold with your designs. You, it's like you know no fear almost. It's, it's, funny, it's funny you say that because, I mean, we all like to, I'm a very humble human being. I'm an empath and I like to help. If I see that someone's hurt, I like to be there and, and, and I literally tell them, throw it on me because, you know, I guess it's a curse and a blessing of having some type of ADD, but, you know, you can like refresh yourself a little bit quicker than most other people can. So I learned to weaponize my charisma and my um, humility to help others. And a lot of people have said that about my designs. And it did take me a while to understand what that really meant. Because um, as I mentioned, my intro when I started to research crochet on my own was the hot couture. So like the fashion houses, Gucci, Chanel, um, Balenciaga, all of that. And I've always been a fan of that on the side, just to for research and aesthetic purposes. Mm -hmm. So when I was getting into this, I already had some type of mental code of construction, how these, I would watch documentaries of hours and hours and hours of how these Italian leather um, craftsmen and artisans are able to just slice individual pieces and then put them together or even, you know, like I said, take it another level and do everything in one piece. Because <laughs> I didn't realize doing something in one piece was way, way harder than doing it in panels and in sections. But um, 
I guess that's always a good thing, you know? And then when people tell me that they want to begin crocheting, I always tell them shoot for the stars first, you know, like the, the, there's a reason why the fashion houses would use that type of aesthetic and that type of color and that type of clutch my pearls. What is he doing <laughs> with that fabric or color? Um, because it really does allow the moment you like constrain yourself to what it, and crochet is so old. It is a very old craft. So I, I completely understand that that type of history overwhelms the more current modern shock value type of um, crochet. So I always tell them that other stuff is always going to be there. There's tons of magazines for it. There's very, um, but if you really want to find your voice, find yourself, you can't really follow rules. You really have to do what feels for you. And that for me was uh, the fashion house has really inspired me to just do me, <laughs> whatever that looked like or whatever that sounded like or whatever it just comes out to be. And I'm very glad when I received those comments, I did take a moment to self-analyze and be like, okay, what do they mean? Because if they're enjoying it, it should be my purpose, not only as a YouTube content creator, but also as someone who wants to get more involved in the crochet world, I have to listen to that. And if they're telling me that, then, you know, I need to figure it out what it is that they like and then try and not replicate it, but just stay inside the realm of what they like. Um, because then you, know, you lose your voice. <laughs> you kind of lose your, your style and everything. And I'm like, no, I kind of want to keep everything that I'm doing. When you see it, that you'll be like, oh, Limon picked those colors or that's like uh, that's something Limon would do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I love that you talk about finding your voice and using your voice, because that's a, been a large part of the work that I've been doing in the past few mm -hmm. months, and is finding my voice. What can I say? What is my, you know, from the business world, my unique value proposition? Mm -hmm. What can I say? Who needs to hear what I can say right. today? Um, and these are really valuable questions that I think everyone should be thinking about. Yeah, and to, to extend <clears throat> that a little bit, it, things are changing. I mean, I sound old saying that, the times are changing, but even within the last, I would even say the last five years, the mark, the business, the, the accessibility, the consumption of fiber arts, whether it's knitting or crochet, but recently it's mm -hmm. been crochet, it has elevated to a level where it's just like, I mean, you had Harry Styles wearing a crochet sweater. You have Olivia Rodrigo right now on the Vogue cover wearing granny squares. Like people are, ex I don't know when the wall broke down, but it did. And now everyone is like so interested. Blackpink even had crochet in one of their music videos. And it was just, it, 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 we have to ask these questions because people want it. And, you know, I still don't know who Harry Styles is, but I'm so in love with that sweater. <laughs> you should know he's a really good artist. You should really listen to his uh, song. I, I don't know. Does it sing Una Fertiva La Grima? <laughs> he's, he's, he's a great, he's a great artist. I, I feel you sometimes because like it took me a while to get into Olivia Rodrigo and she just came out on the Vogue thing and I was like, okay, I'm really glad I heard her album at least once before she she got big. Back in the day, many, many years ago when I was in New York, I was working as a, an office temp for a short time. I was working in the offices of a big name designer and i was going i can't go there i'm sartorially challenged <laughs> but um and and actually at the time i was also a lot heavier than i am now and so um oh well congratulations on your well yeah on your weight <laughs> hey a pound is a pound i was a personal trainer before i did any of this and went into law school so i understand a pound is a pound and you got to celebrate that because yeah, honestly, I we should talk offline about fitness stuff because the last thing I am is fit. But <laughs> um, um, anyway, um, at that time, uh, I mean, they 
I mean, this designer, I've always, I, I, he doesn't have a line anymore, but he does a lot of stuff for other people's lines. Um, uh, and I always admired his stuff. And I remember there was a magazine feature that included like a crochet bikini. It wasn't an offering that he had. Right. But the people who worked around me, they got so many calls about that crochet bikini. So many people wanted it either to offer it for resale or for themselves. That's so cool. <laughs> And it wasn't anything that he was offering. It was just, I mean, uh, he was offering all, all these other things for resort wear, but this crochet right. bikini showed right. up in the photo shoot. I'm pretty sure, I mean, if, if I may ask, was how far, how long ago was this? Because I, crochet bikini could, I, I still see some women clutching their pearls when they see that on Instagram. <laughs> You know, like when it comes to swimwear and crochet, for some reason, people associate like sexuality or like um, they just dirty it a little bit when it's at this when it's kind of like they sell bikinis at Target. So like, why are you reacting this way if it's a crochet bikini <laughs> top on Instagram? There, sense, there, there tends to be an element of sensuality when it comes to promoting that type of garment nowadays in social media. You know, I don't think sensuality is a bad thing. I think mm -hmm. judgment is a bad thing. Right, right. Uh, this was like 1997. Uh, before, yeah, <laughs> probably before you were born. No, 92, uh, 92. But still, I mean, if the Spice Girls were being talked bad about, I could only imagine a crochet. That's what I'm saying. I was like... Even Ginger Spice wearing that cocktail dress with the British flag with the Union Jack on it. That was just, what is she doing? <laughs> Do you know I was born in 62? Oh, nice. Exactly 30 so, years before. <laughs> yeah. So you make me feel so old. No. I well, feel actually, old. no. I felt old even before the conversation started. So it's not <laughs> that thing. Um, but... <laughs> It's all right. I always say I have an old soul, but I'm young at heart because even though I'm about to hit 30 in January. Oh, you poor dear. It must be awful for you. <laughs> no, I still feel so like I do. So I do things sometimes. And like some people around me will be like, well, why, why are you doing that? And I'm like, grow up. And I'm like, no, like, if I, like something like even if I go to like a state fair or something and I see hay bales or even the petting zoo. I'm that weird dude who's like, yeah, I'll pet all the animals. They're so adorable. They're so cute. I'm going to do Well, I love little animals. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I were capable of crouching, I would, you know, <laughs> crouch down and pet them. But <laughs> <laughs> not, not with my knees. But uh, <laughs> I, I used to always say that I was born middle-aged and my body has finally caught up with me. Actually, by now, it's actually overtaken me. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> Wait, so you okay, have okay it's okay okay what yep. it's okay i mean uh, abilities disabilities catching up don't worry about it as long as you're happy as long as you're good you know it's all about and it sounds bad but i've had a history with my family in terms of terminal illnesses so i've seen the progression or degression and when you're young and you're taking care of your grandma or your sick aunt you know, during those final times, it's an unfortunate, like, think about your mortality type of moment and stuff. And being a personal trainer and doing uh, the fitness classes that I did, I understand that, you know, all of that has consequences later on in life, but it's all about, it's easier said than done. It's all about, you know, how you view things and everything like that. Exactly. Yeah, maybe I cannot jump 20 feet high as I did before. But you know what? I'm doing what I'm doing right now. I'm happy. I'm content. And I'm not making life a little bit more miserable for myself. Um, yeah, I, I, very I, cynical. I, I, it's yeah, very like, like I said, it's easier said than done. But like I, when you take care of, of, of so many family members, it's just things that you're forced to talk about. And you're forced. You, you just have to accept it. And, and I see. And you know mm -hmm. what? Physical ailments are far from my biggest worry. So right. I'm 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 doing okay for now. There you go. There and you go. yeah, i you know I might achieve a better level of fitness before I leave this planet. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I might not, but you know what? It's it's not going to make a big impact on my happiness because that depends on a lot of different things. Yeah, as long as your yarn room is stocked, right? You're happy. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I I I I have far too much yarn right now, and I'm trying to work through my. No stash. such thing. No, oh. no such thing. <laughs> Well, if I had the kind of, uh, you know, uh, spontaneous yarn boxes from yarn vendors that you get, <laughs> then I would be pretty happy too. But I buy all of my yarn. Well, actually, a lot of it gets gifted to me, so that's that's pretty nice too. Right, right. But, um, you know um it's it's a blessing and a curse i will tell you that because at first when i started i had the fear that i would not have enough yarn to make enough videos and now i can tell you i have way too much yarn that i can ever use in within at least the next mm -hmm. couple years i would say a couple years because i'm a pretty fast crocheter <laughs> but it, yeah, it, yeah yeah i mean it sounds great and everything but it, it when you because you know it's a business when someone sends you something you kind of want to reciprocate and get wanna, give them the maximum sure, of what yeah. you do so and it's very so, pressuring sometimes when it's just like you get something and then it's like okay exactly. let me get the pictures for them let me do the video for them let me show the garment for them um exactly and and you know i'm i've tried to do tutorials um for the most part, the limitations are really technical, not mm -hmm. not really uh, anything else. Um, but for now, I've put tutorials on hold. Um, I love doing these interviews. I love doing live streams. This is like we were talking about voice, where mm -hmm. this is, I think, where my voice is. At the same time, if Lion Brand is listening, I'm not going <laughs> to turn you down if you want to send me stuff. There you go. There you go. Snap, snap. Lion Brand. Lion Brand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they are my favorite brand, the you know, national brand of yarn. They really are. I, uh, I hate to say this, but yes, I, I, I converted from, I initially started with Yarn Inspiration and the Karen Cakes. Lion Brand has won me over for sure. When it comes to like a big box stores, I will say Big Twist is coming up a close second. Their products have you know improved what? so much within the last year. I, I would agree. Point. I do think that Big Twist is very, very high on my list of store brand budget yarns. Mm -hmm. And I am still very much about the budget yarns. Yeah. I do... I try to avoid the budget yarns that are not fun. Yeah. There are some yarns I don't want to use anymore. There are some <laughs> yarns that give acrylic a bad name. Yeah, no, I, yep, yep. And I think, but I think they're noticing because even up until, I think even Craft Smart has changed their acrylic fiber construction content or whatnot. So they're listening. Uh, like, they're listening, and they realize Red Heart's slowly doing it. <laughs> I mean, they kind of gave up on the Super Saver a bit, but like they're the other stuff that they're putting out. Red Heart's listening in terms no, of. I'm a little <laughs> suspicious about some of those brands, some of those <laughs> budget brands. I mean, I have my favorites, I, and I've gotten to the point where I won't order anything online if I haven't touched it myself. Right. Right. Um because i've had bad experience with things that i order because it seems like a bargain it's not a bargain if it's not fun to use yeah i will say i'm a little bit i take i'm trying to take a break from hand dyed yarns because i get caught up the problem with me is i like to find out more about who i'm supporting and where my the things that i'm using is coming from mm -hmm. And when you discover most of them are women, which I have no problem with, but being raised by a single mom, when I get told the stories of some of these dyers and what they're doing or like how they're balancing a family with their dye, their dye company, it changes 
from me just buying yarn and you can actually see and feel that you're supporting a family, you're supporting a mother, you're supporting someone who, uh, like you said, I, I have dyers who, because of their physical uh, debilitations, they went, they turned to yarn dyeing because it's something that they can actually, it's it's the only thing left that they can do without hurting themselves and other in their other forms of jobs that they had before. So it 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 unfortunately shifted my consumer mindset of oh that's pretty let me get it to let me throw in my you know like like let me support her 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 like, hopefully she'll get a nice little meal today yeah. or hopefully they'll get the <laughs> they'll be able to spend some time with their family here. Do you um, have the the do you have the same feeling that I have? where if I know a dyer, and I only have a, a little bit from independent dyers, but I know mm -hmm. them. And so I, if I create something with a skein from this uh, independent dyer, because I know him, and I'm like doing my stuff with his yarn, it feels like a child that we had together. Yeah. Do you have that feeling? Not, not specifically like that. It Maybe has, not a child. Has, that might be a no, 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 no. But right? I understand what you're saying. In my, I see it more like, I'm, if, <laughs> okay, but to put it all out there, I see myself as if if Van Gogh, if like if, since people can't touch Van Gogh's paintings, if Van Gogh had dyed yarn you could own a piece of what Van Gogh touched, you know? So wow. I, I, that, that's my extremist view where it's kind of like things in a museum. I was always upset that you couldn't like interact with it. You had to see it from 20 feet away. And with this, I see it more like she died this, like she made this, like this person mm -hmm. put blood, sweat and tears into it. And instead of it being framed, I'm using it and my baby is the garment because they give you, <laughs> you know, it takes two to tango. So they give exactly, you yeah. religion, but you manipulate no. it, turn it into a baby. So this is, yeah, in two a way, things, in a way yeah. I have thought about it that way. Two things I would mm -hmm. say. One is you must go to Amsterdam and visit the Van Gogh Museum. Oh, oh my God. And then mm -hmm. the Rijks Museum. Yeah, I mean, you could do you could do a whole week between the two of them and um, and still come away not seeing everything. But also, yeah, with that sort of thing, that that feeling, it's, it's I, I mean, you describe in a different way exactly what I was trying to describe where there's this joint creation feeling with the yarn and the dyeing and the creation, especially if it's my own design. Um, and nowadays, honestly, I get bored with other people's patterns. I don't want to do my own. <laughs> <laughs> I get bored with my own, actually. I keep wanting to create new things. Right. I, in fact, I, I, I want to create, I want to finish like design samples for new patterns um, before they're ready, and then I can move on to some, another new pattern. Right, right. So, I mean, that actually, that leads us into the next topic of your designs, mm -hmm. which are pretty darn terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, it, it makes me sad because, like, my grandma didn't see me evolve into this side of crochet or of design. So it's, it's, I love it when people say that because I always think about how I wish my grandma could see how much I improved and she could see that I found a voice mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. Yeah. So grandma, if you're listening, love you. <laughs> yeah. Both of mine are gone. So, and, and they both did this sort of thing for me. I have a, I have a blanket that one of my grandmothers made for me when I started college. Oh, wow. And that was in 1980. Wow. So, yeah. 
That's pretty cool. What well, that speaks to also for those listening, <laughs> yarns last a lifetime if you take care of them. <laughs> Cause that's really, really cool. Well, I don't even want to think about what the yarn was because I'm sure it was a budget yarn mm -hmm. um, from the time, but still, um, I love that blanket. Nice. And I hesitate to use it for fear I will damage it. Right. Right. No, and I have some, some of my aunts and uncles have some of my grandma's blankets as well on the beds, but you're not allowed to get on it. <laughs> you know, it's something it's just decorative and then they have to mm -hmm. take it off when they go to bed and everything. So um, also my grandma used to do toilet paper toppers, <laughs> which was always a really cool thing. That was the very first thing I learned to crochet. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, and I mean, you're a little child, so you're sitting there in the toilet and you're looking around for, you know, this is before cell phones were a thing. You're trying to just distract the time. Oh, my God. The and long, you're like, oh. long before <laughs> cell phones were a thing. But yeah, because my grandmother was visiting. I think I was probably 10. My sister was 11. And, you know, we were, you know, one on each side of her and she was <laughs> teaching us to, to crochet. And, um, um, and so she taught us to do those things. You know, you do the circle and then you do the tube and, mm -hmm. and she taught us to, to do a granny square. And then, and then I put it aside and didn't pick it up until I was, well, until about five or six years ago. I can't, I can't count high enough to tell you how old I was at that time. But, <laughs> uh, it's all right. Now, did she create... Did she do like a, a half amigurumi at the top of the topper or did she stick a Barbie doll through it and like do the dress? <laughs> I think she did the Barbie doll dress thing. Nice. Both grandmothers did that. Now, this was not the grandmother who did the, 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 uh, the blanket that I went to uh, college with. Okay. Because both of them, both they knitted and crocheted. Because you know, my parents came up in like in the 30s and 40s in North Carolina. So of course their mothers would have been crocheters and and knitters and stitchers and done everything. In fact, my mother, uh, she worked in a um, clothing thing, uh, clothing outlet before she went off to college. She had a few years between high school and college. That's cool. So. Um, and I think that, yeah, on both sides, that was the first generation to have a college education. Wow. Wow. Uh, That's mendable. Really, really nice. Really yeah. nice. I was, yeah, I was part of the first, well, technically my mom, so my mom went back to school while I was in school. So she was finishing up. So she actually beat me. Otherwise, I would have been the first generation to get the college <laughs> education in my family. Um, mm -hmm. but since she got her associates and her bachelor's before me, which she technically won. So, so I guess I have to say I'm second generation, <laughs> but otherwise, oh. I mean, it, it's a lot of stress. It is a lot of stress. It's scary. And yeah, I, I did struggle. I struggled a lot when I went, because like I said, finding my voice was a little bit more important than what a piece of paper said. And I know that sounds mm -hmm. very cynical. That sounds very cold hearted. Not at all. But I would I think see... I, 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 I think mm -hmm. that people in generations before ours would not have recognized the value of what we're talking about. So they might have discounted it. But for us, I think it is incredibly valuable because if we don't find our own voice if we don't know what we're doing in life, then, you know, all of that professional accreditation, all of the accomplishment you can do um, in the outside world means nothing. Right. I agree. I agree. And yeah, you don't want to, I've seen, I've, with, within my fitness job before when I would, train multiple women and, and, and people. Unfortunately, I lost some during, um, sorry, there's like a little fly here. Um, I lost a few clients to COVID 
and I lost a few friends. And even before then, before COVID was even like a, a, a termination fear of life, um, I was training people with with, with um, terminal illnesses, people with uh, not even terminal, like to the point where something as small as diabetes can like really just 360 your life if you're not careful about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I've seen, I guess what I'm trying to say is I've seen regret in the final stages of someone's life because of that, because they didn't know who he or she was. They didn't know, they felt unfulfilled. And that to me is like, I'm glad I went through that because it, it, it it's a tough choice when you, so I, I was, like I said, I was a very big nerd. So I got a really great scholarship to go to school. Um, and I was also on the swim team. So I got a really good sports scholarship with that as well. So I, I was privileged enough to not have a financial burden upon myself to go to one of the top three uh, colleges in the country. And I took it as more of like, if I'm going to be here, it's because I'm going to yeah, education is good and I'm really, really good at the books and everything, but you can't teach, you can't teach charisma, you can't teach humility, you can't teach pain, you can't teach uh, optimism. That's just something where you have to experience it, see it in other people. And if you're not aware of it, that opportunity will pass by you. But if you are somewhat hyper aware of it, you can get so much more value from that. And I'm a big believer in terms, of, I'm a half believer of you have to try it to find out if you like it. Because at the same time, a smart person would look at the experiences from others and take that as a way to, you know, live vicariously mm -hmm. through them. Because I mean, not a, you shouldn't be able to, it's impossible to try everything. And also not everything is good for everyone. <laughs> So, you know, pick your poisons, choose your battles. But um, I was very privileged in the sense that I guess you could say I could sacrifice being at that school to find things that really motivated me and not to, I'm very careful with my words because there's nothing wrong with a nine to five job. There's nothing completely wrong with that. But if it's not for you, it's not for you. And if you don't have the right mindset and the foundation of how to tackle, not even entrepreneurship, but just like other forms of jobs, then you get burned out very, very quickly. And so I discovered my value. I found out that's where I was able to discover that people were drawn to my charisma, were drawn to when I speak, they, they, they like to listen. And sometimes I'd be like, but I'm very boring. Why are you listening to me? But they're just like, you just have this thing. And it's like, okay, well, like I said, if you're not aware of it, you lose <laughs> that opportunity. But um, that's when I got into Zumba and everything because I realized mm -hmm. that people were able to fixate themselves on me. And I'm like, well, if you're going to pay attention to me, you're going to get something out of it. <laughs> and I'm doing the same thing with crochet. I'm like, I think I'm boring. We all think we're boring, you know, <laughs> like we're, as we're recording and doing all this stuff, we're like, am I interesting enough? Is this interesting for them? Uh, actually, I, I think I'm fascinating and it's a mystery to me why I don't have more followers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, that's my good. thing. That's good too. Confidence, you got to throw it out there because if you're not confident, then other people will see that too. Very good. Oh, that is something I learned very early, too. But, you know, back to the nine to five thing, you know, it might be right for you today, but it, and that's OK. It might not be right for you tomorrow or next week or next month. And that's OK, too. Yeah, it's OK to make life changes. And that's something that I've learned along the way. But that's um, a privilege. That idea is such a privilege because I've. There's just so many people who go their lives never hearing those words, never really stopping to think about those words and never actually believing in those words. So never take it for granted either because, yeah. And so many people feel trapped in the situation where they are. 
And, yeah. you know, without even, you know, I, I don't want to invalidate their feelings about their own situations because I don't know their situations. And there might, I'm sure there are legitimate reasons for their feelings of desperation. Um, I, if it's not my business to counsel anyone, but if I were in that business, I would just say that there are more options than you know. I mean, that, that's really all you can say to anyone. There are more options than you know. Mm -hmm. I still remember um, I helped to organize. For my senior high school trip, they were going to take us to an amusement park, and I refused to do that. <laughs> I was being egotistical at the time because I didn't want to spend my senior trip at an amusement park, so I actually helped to organize the top like 15 seniors got to go to a week in Italy and we got to tour different cities. So I was like, if I'm going to, we're going to go on a trip. Oh my this, God. This is a South side high school in Chicago. So like it is unheard of to do something like that because we're just, we're in the ghetto. Wow. But you know, I, 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 would... I remember all those songs from the seventies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And so I, I told him, I was like, you know what? No, let's do this. Even if only 15 people get to go, I think that will change 15 lives more than if 200 people go to an amusement. I mean, they ended up still going. I think it was Cedar Point, which is nothing wrong with Cedar Point. I just didn't want that to, to be the culmination of, yeah, my, yeah. of my high yeah. school year. I, 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 I completely you know? understand you. Yeah, that, you remind me, my ex used to talk about his, um, uh, his college Italian club uh, and their big thing was an outing to go to see Mamma Mia on Broadway and their, and going and and he at the time he was going mama mia has nothing to do with the italian language yeah they're in greece right in yeah greece. exactly and the song is by a swedish group yeah so, um it has but that's what they wanted i mean i you know it was probably fun for them and that's all they really wanted right you know kids right these but, young people today yeah but to like to 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 hit the nail on the head i i remember getting off or the plane ride because this was the first time i ever left the country let alone go to mm. europe and the graphic of the airplane showing you the route to europe in the airplane seat mm -hmm. the best way i can describe it is okay you know how like your vision is here but technically, like, you feel your vision is, like, somewhere back here in the back of your head. I literally felt that expand a little bit. And as, when I got off the plane and literally touched outside into, because um, we had to do a stop in 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 in, in Sweden, the capital, because you, you go Stockholm? north. Yeah, you go, uh, was it Stockholm? I think so. There's like a, there's, there's, you go north and then you go down into Europe. Like mm -hmm. normally that's how the planes do it. And or did I was, you stop in Iceland? <sighs> it's I've had, the, I've had flights where, where we stopped in Iceland. No, 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 Switzerland. It was Switzerland because there was a vodka. There was tons of the, 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 the Swiss, Switzerland vodka was, was all over the airport. Oh, oh I wish I'd been on that flight. Though. Oh, what was it? I can't remember. But anyways, I got off and, yeah, like my brain just literally, if I could feel it expand, being like, this planet is huge. <laughs> like, I never, I mean, yeah, you see the globe and the little kid, you see the maps and everything, but you don't really feel how big this planet is until you leave your country, until you go somewhere as far as from the United States to Europe. Yeah. I'm telling you, it was like a mental, a brain massage where like my vision just went like bloop. And then when we got to Italy, it did it again. And I was like, wow. Like, so I can totally understand your, your viewpoint of letting people know that there's more options because people hear it, but not a lot of people believe it. 
and it, it, there, yeah. there's a big difference between that. You remind me of um, <clears throat> uh, one summer when I was in school. I spent the summer in Salzburg, Austria, because I was in music school. And it, oh my God, as a music student, what a place to be. But I also learned that there are people in this world who actually think and feel in German. What is that about? <laughs> wow. <laughs> They're on the wrong hemisphere. <laughs> I know. It's like they don't go through this translation filter that we have. Right. They think and feel in German. Right. <laughs> and and that took a really long, I wish I had had a lot longer than six weeks there. Mm -hmm. Um. And it was only a number of years later when I I fell in love with somebody I met online who was German. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started uh, really reinforcing my German. And I started doing, Ger I was doing cassette tapes, if that tells you how long ago that <laughs> oh was. Oh my God. And yeah, and, and I had a long morning and evening commute, so I would, and those tapes, they were incredibly valuable because that there's this thing, because I had all of this knowledge in my head, but there was like this barrier between my head and my tongue. But with these tapes, I was forced to interact and um, it made a huge difference. Oh yeah, you I think know. that uh, immersion, immersion technique, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I remember I had a, oh my God, I only took one year of French, but <laughs> ah, <laughs> teach the class in French and I'm like, why are you teaching in French if I'm trying to learn French? And she's like, it's immersion, it's immersion, you'll learn, you'll pick it up, it's easier this way. And I'm like, okay. Do you uh, know they, they offer, I don't know if they still do it, they used to offer these immersion weekends where you could go as, as an adult student, um, you know, no longer in college or anything, but as an adult student, you could go and spend a whole weekend learning different languages. Nice. And I was really fascinated by that, but I never got to do them. I would love, I don't even know if they offer them now. And now, you know, I, I well, used Technically, to isn't that study abroad now? You just spend a whole semester in another country? Well, no, I, think, I think that's what it's grown into at this point where like, you well, yeah, of, of, of course. But um, this was in uh, on college campuses in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time when I was looking into it, I was living uh, in suburban New York, uh, the, the Westchester area. Um, and that, but now I'm in North Carolina. God only knows what's available here for any kind of education. But um, it's a lot more open. My sister's actually, she's living in Paris right now. She's actually here visiting us for a month, but um, she went to school in Paris and they have an American school in Paris. So things are mm -hmm. a little bit more accessible now where American schools are actually branching out and having um, international institutions uh, directly. That's like from us over there, as opposed to others hosting the American curriculum as well. Yeah. Well, even back in the day, there were international schools there, maybe not so much here, unless you were in a big city. New York always had the, you know, the Alliance Francaise or the uh, uh, Goethe Institute mm -hmm. for, for uh, German. But, um, and, it, and do you know, I lived 27 years in the New York tri, New York City tri-state areas and, and before that, five years in South Florida. You would think I would have picked up a little more Spanish than I did. <laughs> Not so much. Uh, it's okay. I mean, well, I'm trying to think. Well, there's more Italian in New York, correct? Because that's where the uh immigrants wow. from europe would port at so you well, would have italian yeah but irish but and Polish. i would always get mocked 
for my Italian 101 uh, oh. pronunciation from these Brooklyn second and third generation Italian Americans, because by that time I would have morphed into something else. They would they would be saying uh, Manigot, and I would say Manicotti. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, just pull out the guy, Father. He has to just start talking like this. <laughs> They'll pick it up. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know the old joke. How do you silence an Italian? Tie his hands together. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just doing all of this, too. <laughs> anyway, we shouldn't Funny. tell jokes like that on YouTube. <laughs> oh, no. We're inclusive. We're inclusive. We're a very yeah. inclusive channel. We love everybody, cats and dogs. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, what, oh my god, that's funny though. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I it, well, I don't know where I picked mine up, but I didn't I do this all the time with my hands. I think it's maybe my crochet. My my girlfriend tells me it's my crochet hands when like I'm talking. Is that and I use my hands and everything. I tend to have it in like a hook position, and I'm like talking to people like this. I'm like, sorry. Are, are you a, a pencil hook or a knife hook? Uh, yeah. pencil. Oh, pencil. really? Pencil, but when I use thick yarns, I switch to, to knife. Yeah, because yeah. oh, it's just oh, I it's it. I don't know, maybe because the yarn is heavier or whatnot, but it tends to tire out my wrist a lot when I use yeah, thicker yarn. Whatever works for you, yeah. Yeah. Are, are you yarn first or pattern first? Yarn first. Yarn first. I like to see what they would like to become. I'm, I'm so, okay. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that does it, but I talk to my yarn sometimes or I'll like, oh, I'll be like, too. what do you want to become? What do you want to be? I, I, I have some yarn that I bought from a, um, if you watch this series of interviews, the very first one I did was Daniel from Popfly Yarns, mm -hmm. who is a hand dyer. And I, I got some that actually he and I designed together and it's called Ginger Bear. Nice. So I have two hanks of that. I wish I could have afforded to buy more, but. Right, right. You know, the shipping and everything. Right, right, and, right. You know, it's reasonable prices for hand dyed yarn. I cannot fault him for that. But uh, the shipping is not cheap. But anyway, so I've been trying, I've been asking this yarn what it wants to be. It hasn't no. told me yet. Oh, uh, not yet. Um, it's still, it's it still will. in crystalline phase. Yeah. Well, it it's will. thinking about it. It's waiting for the right moment because will, yeah. yarn is in tune with the universe, you know? Sometimes you gotta wait. It's waiting. It's Indeed. waiting because it knows you're gonna be inspired eventually one day. Indeed. Do you know, I have some other yarn that I got like on sale that mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I can use that. And, and a friend of mine gave me this. Basically, it's like a stitch dictionary. Um, so that's where I get a lot of inspiration Nice. Uh, is I, I'll find a stitch and I'll think, oh, what can I do with that? Right. So I was looking through this stitch book that she gave me. And then I thought, oh, wouldn't that be nice? You're going to have to send me the title of that book because I'm currently in the art. That's where my artistic mind is at right now. Oh, OK. Hold on. Wait. Uh Indispensable stitch collection for crochets. Got it. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Dude, you're gonna have the video. Oh right. <laughs> I just took a picture of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah. So I had this this uh, yarn. My old brain moment right there. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I had I, I had this nice yarn that I had gotten from mm -hmm. um, Dollar Tree. Mm -hmm. where it was like two skeins of like 875 yards each. Oh, wow. But they for $3 each. Nice. Uh, but they were one weight. And I, I do not have a lot of experience with anything that light. Mm -hmm. But because it's two skeins, I'm double stranding it. Oh, okay, okay. And this is what I've got so far. <gasps> Ooh. Yeah. So, oh, is that um, like a honeycomb motif? This is the, it's called a, a sieve stitch in the book, anyway. 
Oh, okay. And yeah. it's really very easy. And that looked so, like a Westnitz. Sorry to interrupt, but that looked like a Westnitz honeycomb. You know how he kind of like claimed the honeycomb look for knitting? That mm -hmm. looked really, really good. If you yeah. double layer that over another cape, that would mm. look really good. Because then you can do a solid cape underneath and just layer that over and you'll see the honeycomb. Well, yeah, exactly. You could wear it over any... And honestly, it's, it's actually heavier than I expected it to be. And I'm not... Maybe I'm two thirds of the way through of uh, you know both of the both of the skeins, um, and I've done the pattern already mm -hmm. because it's an easy pattern. It's an easy repeat. Mm -hmm. um, but creating this this sample it takes a long time because it's like all of these long rows of single crochet. Right. Um, but it, um, I'm going to be very pleased with that. And I'll be quite disappointed if it doesn't sell. <laughs> You'll be fine. Yeah. You'll be fine. Honestly, uh, my shawls seem to do very well. I'm very pleased with that. That's good. That's good analytics because I never know. I've kind of turned into like a cape fiend. But I realize mm. not a lot of people like capes because it's closed. You know, they'd rather have the openness of a shawl. I just can't. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm not there yet when I'm married to the idea of a shawl. I find them to be very, they just feel like large scarves to me. And then I'm like, whereas a cape. Well, that's what a lot of them are. A right. lot of them become large rectangular wraps, which are basically oversized scarves. Right. Um, I don't mind selling that. Yeah. You know? But um, hey, yeah, you, you're you're definitely finding out. I guess it's easier to find out the analytics when it comes to when you sell a pattern because people are specifically buying that silhouette, that aesthetic, as opposed to a YouTube video where you're like, why are they even watching this? Like, does this mean they actually like this, <laughs> or they're just watching it to, you know, to hate watch it or like to yeah. just question it and just be well, curious? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But you know, I don't do. I don't do very many tutorials, so. I did try. Um, I tried so hard to do like the typical YouTube tutorial as well, but then I just gave up on it and I would, cause it was, it was messing with my internal voice happiness of it. I wasn't having fun doing them. And I exactly. was, and I told myself, I'm like, if you never really watch those, why would you try and make them? So now when I talk about a tutorial on my channel, I picture someone like me who if I'm like, if I describe something, so if I grab something and I'm like, I did this and they see it, they'll be able to replicate it. Cause I think there's more people like that now as opposed yeah, to following step exactly. by step. And also yeah. I give them the freedom to change it. I love it when people are like following something and then they add their own little flavor to it. And I'm like, that's great. Well, that's, that, that's one thing I always do is, is I try to encourage people to measure it based on what their own needs are. Right, um, which is where I'm struggling because I'm I'm currently writing patterns. I've been practicing for about six months now, half a year. It's I want to have because uh, I see pattern writing as kind of like writing a book, where a part of you, where people are purchasing your pattern because of your voice, because of how you're presenting the information. And yeah, you could follow the Craft Yarn Council guidelines and stuff, but I found that very, very limiting for me. And I would much rather tell a story in the pattern as you're doing it. So that way it kind of feels like you're reading a short story and also like creating something at the same time. Well, um, actually that, that brings up two different things. One is that um, I have been very 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 fortunate to have some high profile people do tutorials with my own patterns nice nice and second also um i'm starting to write uh, i i do have a crochet blog i'm starting to write stories about my crochet pieces that so that it, it becomes a narrative and it becomes a little bit more than you know, do 114,000 single crochets for this foundation row, you know? Now is the time to do that. Yeah, like I, like, like we mentioned before in the beginning of this, of this podcast, 
the times are changing for crochet. And if you, you have to be very open to seeing where the art is going right now. And it's kind of like you see it in other types of clothing with shoes, with uh, jeans, with uh, dresses. It's all about the narrative. It's all about the story behind those pieces of clothing. When celebrities are collaborating with other big store clothing brands or even makeup, the story behind a makeup palette, are you kidding me? When all of that was booming last year, you know, people were like, oh, I'm going to buy this because James Charles's life at that po moment in time, like he's putting out this narrative. Oh, I'm going to buy this because Selena Gomez went through this when she was creating it. Or I'm going to do this because Rihanna was uh, talking about a certain topic and that's why she created this product. People love a narrative and people love... Uh, this is just a cup, but if I knew what happened in the making of this cup and the person who was doing it and why they chose why to make that look like that, the, the, the culture of consumerism is leaning more towards the storytelling. It's going back to like the old times where the story mattered instead of the product. Because uh, I call it snake oil, snake oil salesman technique where the story, it didn't really matter what the miracle cure was. What mattered was how much the guy was hyping it up and what was going on in the stories of other people using that product. Mm -hmm. um, and it just happened with oh my God, what was it? the hair pomade. Oh my God, what was her name? The documentary on Netflix with um, uh, Viola, Viola Davis. I think it was Viola Davis. Where she, um, Madam C.J. Walker. <laughs> How she had to like sale her, sell her hair products to the African-American community through story because none of them really trusted um, at that time the white capitalistic um, messaging of it. Actually, <laughs> I, I saw a fantastic video uh, that totally removed from fashion, craft, or anything. But um, um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Tom Daly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the British diver who is also a knitter and crocheter. His husband is an Oscar winning um, screenwriter and producer. He gave a talk, I believe it was at Oxford, um, about the power of story. That just makes me misty thinking about it. Oh. Because the power of story mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's, if you think about it, that's where the best advertising is. I mean, go back to the days of plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. Mm -hmm. There was a story there. Um, yeah, you know, that's that's where the power is, and that's where the influence is in story, and that's where the understanding is, and the relationship, and that is where we gain more allies than we lose. Whatever it is we're talking about, right. So, um, uh, anyway, anyway, I, I mean, we've gotten way more serious than I really <laughs> to do. But uh, again, you know, these things go wherever the spirit leads us. And mm -hmm. clearly, you know, we like to talk about these deep things. Um, so, um, you... You said paralegal school. I thought you were in law school, as in one of. Well, it's going to lead into it. I first have to um, get my associates, and then I can technically go into law school. You can't just like jump like that. So, oh, <laughs> I'm, in a, I'm in a paralegal okay. program right now for that's going to be for two years, and then from there I can apply to one of the big law schools over here in Chicago. Okay. Well, there, you're not hurting for law schools there in Chicago. Yeah. Or for any <laughs> kind of university, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I um 
I like Chicago actually. It's been a while since I've been there. But um it's a beautiful city. Yeah, uh, the we- the winters can be harsh, but I like them because of that cuz then it, you stay home and you get to crochet and you get to wear <laughs> the nice stuff you make over yeah, here more often. Yeah, I spent a good part <laughs> of my childhood in Minnesota. So Yeah. <laughs> I know a little bit about winters, but um uh yeah, yeah, exactly. Um So Oh wow, how how do you think you could combine a legal career with crafting? Ooh, that's an interesting question. I can't believe I'm the first one to ever ask you that. Yeah. Um Well, the way I see it is the stresses from the legal market will require much therapy. So crochet will be my my palate cleanser of the daily work that um, is coming my way. <laughs> um, because even now, like as I'm practicing uh, interning for um, my aunt who does a lot of immigration work and, and public notary stuff, you'd be surprised. You learn a lot. It's kind of like a doctor. A doctor knows a lot about a lot of people because of the personal information that's on there. And like I said, I'm an empath and I absorb people's energies. So when you're told some of these stories and some of these situations, I need a palate cleanser and, and crochet is that for me. So if anything, I'll be able to have my own personal therapy (laughs) whenever I get stressed or whatnot. So legally, I guess legally though, I'll be able to help my fiber community be a little bit more legit Um, because as much as people want to do anything that they want to do, there's business laws, there's uh, city laws that you have to follow um, that, you know, to make yourself more authentic for in the, um, the social experiment kind of, of, of way. Exactly. Even on social media, there are regulations that you need to be aware of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, That's a good question, though. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, it, is, it is quite interesting. Also, um, pattern, I guess patterns, I'll be able to finally understand how to, like, trademark things a little bit much better than the average person. Because that's a big issue right now, too. A lot of people are stealing crochet designers. Uh, what was going on a couple weeks ago? The Shein, Shine the Shine company was stealing people's crochet tops and manufacturing them, as producing them. And there's really not much you can do unless you know. I how to actually, I, I did not hear about that, but I have heard many stories about, people, about um, some of the big box stores, like reproducing patterns um in quantity and making kits to do these um like local um knit along or crochet along groups without uh compensating the actual designers of those patterns yeah um yeah. i it would not surprise me to learn that 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 has happened to some of my patterns but you know, it's not my biggest priority right now. Right now, give me a few years, and then we'll be able to talk about exactly. I'll be able to for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope we will be great friends from now on and talk frequently over the next few years and beyond. Of course, of course. I'm more than. I mean. Do no harm, right? <laughs> it's not exactly. it's a proper mantra. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a mantra that you know you should live by every day. But I'm very I love if painters were considered crazy people back then <laughs> as the crazy artists, then they haven't met crocheters yet. And I'm yeah. more than entertained with the many characters that are in the fiber community. Yeah, well, you you know the old saying about poets, saints, and fools. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
but um, yeah. So I'm very glad. I'm very happy. I'm more than happy to to uh, indulge and jump in. Uh, so you seem like a very nice guy. This is a very great podcast. I'm having a great time here. Exactly. Um, and so I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see who else we'll, we'll be able to meet along this journey. Exactly. And I, I hate to do this, but we've been doing, we've been talking for over an hour. <laughs> and... yeah, you'll be good with your content. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, no, I just hate to, to call it to a close. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop recording, but stick around okay. and, and we'll talk more. So I want to thank everybody who has been watching this whole time. And then you know the whole thing like subscribe comment share the standard youtube crap and keep coming back bye bye now and thank you so much